Well, good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, my name is Thomas Crawford. I'm a, a, a cardiologist, and specifically a cardiac electrophysiologist. I um, deal with heart rhythm abnormalities, both fast and slow. And I have a particular interest in this disease. And along with uh, my senior colleague, Dr. Bogan, who's another electrophysiologist, we uh, have um, started a multi-center uh, registry of patients with cardiac sarcoidosis, of which I'll tell you um, at the very end of this talk. So uh, I will focus on just two key co concepts about how you can navigate this, um, this uh, disease. Uh, I will talk very briefly about inflammation, what kind of symptoms are expected, uh, how is it diagnosed, how is it uh, treated, and finally about the registry. So the purpose of the heart is to pump blood to all tissues in the body and perfuse it, is the fancy word, with uh, oxygen and, um, and all the metabolic uh, needs that the, uh, the body needs. And in order to be an effective pump, it has to be a uh, there has to be a way to transmit electrical impulse to the heart rapidly. And so there's this uh, specialized highway system of conducting electrical impulse from the top of the heart to the bottom part of the heart. And sarcoidosis can actually affect both this highway as well as the rest of the heart muscle. Um, and so it can result in both arrhythmias and in weakening of the heart muscle, which is um, uh, what heart failure essentially is. Uh, you've already seen granuloma on the uh, prior um, presentation, and uh, that is the, the diagnosis that uh, can be made uh, from the biopsy in the heart. So what are the manifestations of this inflammation of the heart? For one, a patient can develop what's known as a heart block. And a heart block means that there are signals that are generated by the normal pacemaker up on top of the heart, but then that there's absolutely no connection between that signal and what's known as escape rhythm at the bottom of the heart. There's also a possibility of rapid heart rhythm, and that's actually oftentimes more dangerous than the heart block. And those specific names that would um, refer to this are ventricular tachycardia, VT or VTAC, and ventricular fibrillation or VFib or VF. And then finally, you have the congested heart failure, basically the muscle, the pump not being efficient enough and not being able to uh, distribute the blood as efficiently throughout the body. So about two to five percent of patients with sarcoidosis have clinical manifestations of cardiac sarcoidosis. And up to 25% of patients may have some, some evidence of inflammation, um, which does not necessarily translate into any, anything apparent or any type of disease. That is one of the challenges, is because you want to be able to prevent progression of uh, inflammation and progression to scarring. But we really have no great ways of identifying who those patients would be that would benefit from treatment the most. And of course, why sarcoidosis affects the heart in some patients, but not in others, is not known. So this is really a field that's ripe for, uh, for exploration. What are the symptoms of cardiac sarcoidosis? Well, in terms of the arrhythmias, you can have um, usually rapid heart rates that may cause lightheadedness, or heart block can cause lightheadedness. And we're talking about lightheadedness here that's not necessarily positional. Most uh, people have some sort of, some degree of positional lightheadedness. If you stand up, you may be lightheaded. That's generally not the type of lightheadedness that we worry about. This is lightheadedness that is uh, oftentimes um, uh, you know, occurring while somebody is sitting or while somebody is laying in bed. Lightheadedness that may be associated with heart fluttering. Some people describe this as palpitations. Uh, it could be described as emptiness in the chest or just not, you know, a sudden feeling of not being able to get a breath. Passing out is particularly ominous, especially if there's no warning sign before. So usually when you're dealing with heart rhythm abnormalities, the events are sudden, and if they're reversible enough for the patient to survive, you basically don't really have a whole lot of 
symptoms before and generally no symptoms after. There is just this gap of time that you cannot explain when you're out. And, and unfortunately, sometimes sudden death is the first manifestation of the disease. Now, heart failure has uh, even more nonspecific symptoms that can be found in a variety of illnesses. Uh, fatigue, cough, shortness of breath. I mean, those are uh, very common with pulmonary involvement, of which most patients have. So it's difficult to tease that out. And you have to uh, investigate uh, whether there's actually a, a heart failure component to these symptoms. And swelling in the, in the lower body would be one of the symptoms that might increase the index of suspicion so that you actually investigate that heart failure as being the cause of shortness of breath as opposed to just uh, sarcoidosis of the, of the lung. So how is cardiac sarcoidosis diagnosed? The most widely available test is uh, ECG, electric cardiogram, and that, that uh, is a, the best non-invasive test of assessing the, the conduction system in the heart, which I told you was very uh, in, uh, intimately involved in the pathogenesis in the presentation of the disease. Um, we also have, you know, when patients have palpitations, and at the time when they're in the office, you do an EKG. That EKG only represents what happens to the heart at the time when you're taking the EKG. So if you have palpitations that occur once a week or once a month, um, a better test is either a Holter monitor, which is um, worn for up to two days, or an event monitor, which can be worn for up to a month. And most event monitors have a button, essentially all of the modern ones do, at least, where if you have symptoms, you activate the button, and then the device will record at least the 45 seconds before you activated the button to actually figure out what the palpitations were. And of course, I want to emphasize here that not all palpitations are ominous. So there are actually not infrequently times when we perceive something that we describe as a palpitation, and then the rhythm that we observe is actually completely normal. So uh, palpitation is a, a relatively nonspecific uh, complaint. Uh, a more uh, involved test is an echocardiogram, but still uh, widely available um, throughout the country. Uh, echocardiograms are ultrasounds of the heart, and the best way uh, to describe the heart function through all the heart uh, ultra, function is described in the ultrasound by observing the uh, chamber sizes and. Uh, the contractility of the different chambers uh, in the heart, as well as valvular function. More specific for the for arriving at the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis are two other imaging tests that are called PET and MRI, that I'll talk about briefly uh, in the next several slides. And then, of course, biopsy. So when it comes to cardiac involvement, biopsy is positive up to 20% of the time. When there is, cardiac involvement in sarcoidosis. So a positive biopsy is very helpful because it clinches the diagnosis. A negative biopsy does not mean that you don't have the disease. And part of the reason for that is that, as you can see on this uh, uh, picture uh, next to the, uh, on the right hand side, is that the disease process is patchy. And so there is some randomness to your ability to pick up a tiny piece of tissue from a specific portion of the heart, which is most easily accessible. And it may not be the, the part of the heart that actually has inflammatory cells. So, there are, so we always strive to get a biopsy, uh, but uh, oftentimes our patients uh, don't have a positive biopsy. We can't get a positive biopsy. And management of patients like that are very challenging because you don't want to expose them to potentially dangerous therapy if you don't have uh, significant enough evidence that that's the disease you're treating, you're treating the right disease. And I, I believe Dr. Colling will be just uh, talking more about this, uh, this issue a little bit later. So the two main tests that we use in, in the field of cardiology to diagnose um, this condition is uh, what's known as a PET study or positive condition tomography. It essentially is a test of metabolic activity of the heart. So inflammation uh, 
has a very high metabolic rate and inflammatory cells, when you try to image inflammation in the heart, will, show, will light up as, as being the most intensely active cells. And inflammation can be seen, this metabolic activity can be seen by observing a glucose analog. So most tissues in the body, or I mean all tissues in the body, will pick up glucose and so does heart, in addition to free fatty acids. And so what you want to do is you want to uh, show that the amount of uptake of this sugar is greater in the parts of the heart where there's inflammation. And in order to do that, you have to suppress the uptake by the rest of the muscle. And that's why there is a strong requirement for a very uh, particular diet before uh, the PET studies are done, which is carbohydrate free. Uh, and it allows us to have uh, imaging of much higher quality. And so sometimes in our laboratory, um, what we do is we um, draw blood from patients, and if there's uh, evidence that the test was not adequate, that, or if the patient admits that they were not um, very diligent with their diet, we basically reschedule the study, because otherwise it's a, it's a waste of effort on everybody's part. Um, and one of the advantages of the study is that can, it can then be repeatedly. And in our field, uh, we have used um, PET studies to assess disease activity and to guide our treatment with immunosuppression. Uh, the downside of this is radiation exposure. And so, and of course there's also cells due to this and all the inconvenience. So there's, there's a certain limit on how often you want to have this study done. And, how often that should be done is actually up for a day. Now, the other studies that are very helpful, other imaging studies that help you diagnosing cardiac sarcoidosis, especially in the absence of tissue, is cardiac MRI. And the cardiac magnetic resonance imaging offers a, a, a better way to see scar, which is the thing that is really very strongly associated with bad outcomes. So presence and extent of scar help determine whether somebody uh, should have a defibrillator. Much more than uh, just mere presence of heart dysfunction, which can be easily uh, found on macro. The downside of this is that people who have older type ICDs or pacemakers, so defibrillators or pacemakers, um, have a relative contraindication. It's an off-label use. We do image all patients with MRIs, uh, or with ICDs with MRIs here, uh, but that is done under a specific protocol that's not available in, in most healthcare facilities. And of course, uh, cardiac MR scanner uh, doesn't um, doesn't allow you a lot of space. So if, if you're afraid of being uh, in, a, in a confined uh, environment, it is, it is very uncomfortable. So the treatment of cardiac involvement um, involves immunosuppressive medications, uh, heart failure medications that are used for a, a general, like a general um, variety of uh, heart failure conditions. Um, the type of devices that I specifically implant to help patients with sarcoidosis are pacemakers and defibrillators. Uh, and on the next slide, I will show you the difference about what, uh, what they do. And I also do ablation therapy in some cases uh, after a patient has failed both immunosuppression <coughs> and arrhythmic medication to control the rhythm. So the way that we implant pacemakers is we, um, we find the, the vessel that drains your left arm, sometimes it could be right arm, and we put our leads, which are cable cords, into the heart, we advance it all the way into the inside of the heart, and then uh, the, on top of the muscle and under the skin, we place this relatively small electronic device the image up here shows a pacemaker, the image down there uh, shows a defibrillator. The difference between the two devices is that pacemakers prevent your heart from going too slow. That's the only thing that they do. And defibrillators, their goal is to uh, abort a cardiac arrest. So basically, deliver either rapid pacing therapy or shocks, high voltage shocks, to basically sink all the cells in the heart so that they beat together so that the pump can actually function well. And pay, the defibrillators can also pace, these are the kinds that we would be considering for in patients with uh, cardiac sarcoidosis. 
the implantation risks are uh, relatively small. Generally, there's an overnight hospitalization. And having a device um, creates a necessity for follow-up. We normally see our patients at one week or two months and then every six months thereafter. Um, this follow-up is facilitated greatly by home monitoring, which is now widely available with all companies. Um, and so essentially, uh, at the bedside, you have a monitor which can transmit information to us in case we receive a shock that you may not know about, or if there's a problem with some type of component of the device. So we highly encourage home monitoring. It also uh, reduces the need for every three month visits in our clinic. Now, when should you seek a second opinion? Um, some of the things that I see that, that I believe patients might have benefited from an earlier second opinion is um, those who have unexplained heart blood before the age of 60. You know, the need for a pacemaker is not unusual in that older age category, but really it's, it, with the exception of very few uh, circumstances, it's highly unusual before you're 60 years old. So if, it, if someone needs a pacemaker for complete heart blood before the age of 60, it should be considered seriously that they may have this disorder. And if you pick up a disorder like that early, you may be able to alter the natural history of the disease by administering immunosuppressants early. Uh, what would be some other uh, triggers for a second opinion? Maybe if, if you have an established diagnosis of sarcoidosis somewhere in your body, and now you have cardiac symptoms, and the doctor doesn't connect the dots between the extra cardiac disease and the cardiac disease. And in this case, the biopsy and the advanced imaging with PET and MRI um, is key. And of course, anytime they have worsening symptoms and you lose confidence, is probably another thing your provider is another reason for, uh, for a second opinion. Uh, we generally do not uh, restrict activity or work for uh, patients with uh, sarcoidosis, but that does vary on an individual basis. Just the sheer presence of cardiac sarcoidosis is not really a contraindication to activity. But in some patients who are too sick or whose uh, rhythm problems get worse with uh, activity, um, we would certainly uh, make specific recommendations Having a, a, a defibrillator place in most in most uh, jurisdictions uh, precludes you from being able to be a commercial driver, uh, and so there are certainly ways in which therapy and the disease can affect uh, your ability to work and do things. But um, there are very few uh, times when we actually constrain uh, people from from performing certain uh, ordinary uh, tasks. Now, healthy diet and weight control is very important, especially considering the fact that uh, you know, it's much easier to pick up weight when you're on prednisone, and so you have to have the mindset of, you have to have the mindset that you have to work two or three times as hard as everybody else to keep it off, and you clearly vulnerable to infections, including the device infections. The devices, when they get infected, they have to come out in order to get the infection. Make sure you stick to the pacemakers and defibrillators and eradication and the infection is sometimes impossible without removal of the device. And so of course then there, you know, this is a rare disorder, especially as it relates to cardiac involvement, right? I mean sarcoidosis is not that common. Then you, you go into a disease process that affects up to five percent of patients with that very disorder. And so there are many unanswered questions. You know, what is the role of steroid treatment? and how it impacts uh, clinical course depending on the different manifestations of the disease. What's the effect of other immunotherapy? How, we how would we best prevent sudden cardiac death? How should we risk stratify patients for this? And how often should we do that? Uh, the studies that, that have been done um, show that um, cardiac MR has a, a probably most promising role in risk stratification. But if you have a normal MRI this year, should you get one two years from now, or five years from now, or six months from now? 
What is the best, most cost-effective uh, method to screen for the disease? Currently, the, the recommendation is that uh, all patients with sarcoidosis should have an annual EKG, which is a pretty crude way of figuring stuff out. And then if you have symptoms, then some sort of ambulatory ECG monitoring. But that's, um, you know, that has what we call limited sensitivity. So the ability to pick up disease is somewhat limited using that crude method. Um, and what role of advanced imaging should we use in guiding treatment? So many of these answers we're trying to hope, we're hoping to answer with a consortium, uh, which we have. This consortium includes about 25 centers in the United States and outside, where we essentially just collect data on patients who have cardiac involvement with the disease. And there's particular focus on arrhythmia, particular focus on the drugs that people are using, and uh, the imaging studies, and we're trying to figure out how to best take care of patients with this very challenging condition. Uh, at present, we have about 500 patients, um, and um, we get inquiries from various centers um, almost on a, on a monthly basis about um, participating joining the yeah. uh, That's all I have for today. Thank you very much.